Can you please make very, very welcome Professor Michael Rukas. Thank you. I just want to tell you how pleased I am to come back. It's such a thrill to talk to you guys. It's about the fun stuff. So, I'm going to talk to you today about neuroscience, and tomorrow morning I'm going to talk to you about the underlying physics and nanoscience that will allow us to investigate the complexity of the brain, which is incredibly complex. Let's talk about how complex it is. But before I do that, I should acknowledge that everything I'm doing is in collaboration with other people. Perhaps I'm the least important person, but at the end of the talk, you'll see a, uh, a bunch of the people that I'm working with. So, let's talk about the brain, and let's put it in the context of computation. Here's the state of the art of computation. It fills up a very large room. It's the IBM Blue Gene Q. It has 1.6 million processors, and that means something like 10 to the 15 transistors. Okay? And all those transistors running when they do computation take about 8 megawatts of power. That's a good fraction of, a, of the output of a power plant. And that will give you 20 petaflops uh, of computational activity. Here's the brain. It has a similar level of complexity. There's 100 billion neurons in our brains. Each one of those neurons connects to something like 1,000 to 10,000 other neurons through axons and dendrites. The connections are called synapses. And you can see there's a similar level of complexity. But this runs on 20 watts, and it's wetware. If we think about how much it costs to run this IBM Blue Gene Q, it's about $10 million a year just for the power. That would feed about 2,200 people in the Western world, run 2,200 brains for a year. Okay? We know a lot about how this works. It's surprising, but we know almost nothing about how the brain works. Now, that's not to denigrate all the incredible accomplishments in neuroscience for the last, let's say, 100 years. But still, things of this complexity are really hard to approach. So that's what I want to talk to you about. So our story begins with two gentlemen who hated each other. Uh, this is Ramon Cajal and Camilo Golgi. And this fellow here, uh, Camilo Golgi, developed a stain that allowed him to stain only one in a thousand um, of the neurons in the brain. And if you do that, one in a thousand, you can make some very pretty pictures. Okay, and these kind of pretty pictures, slices of the stained brain, uh, were the things that uh, Ramoni Cajal investigated for the rest of his life. And what's interesting about this, if you stained all the neurons in the, in the brain, you'd have a black pulpy mess. But if you only stained one in a thousand, you begin to tease out these incredibly complex forests of connections that the individual neurons, we call these processes, the axons and the dendrites, all the wiring that connect between the different neurons in the brain. Let's fast forward to the present. Today we have specialized stains of different colors where we can stain all of the neurons, not just one in a thousand. And when you do that, you begin to appreciate how just unbelievably complex the brain is. And, you know, as somebody who sp has spent his life thinking about how to make complex measurements, this makes me want to go home and lie face down in my pillow. I don't know how to approach the complexity of the brain. But we're going to make a stab at it anyway. So what you're seeing here is, so they call this brain bow because the randomly different colors are stained for different uh, neurons in the brain. This was invented by Jean Levet, a postdoc at Jeff Lichtman's lab at Harvard. Um, and this is a slice of the mouse brain. And this region here, this is the cortex out here. I'll talk about the structure of the brain as we go along. The, the outside is the cortex, where a lot of the computation is done. This region here is called the hippocampus. Uh, this is involved in memory storage and in sleep. And if you zoom in, there's a layer of cells here. 
This is that layer of cells there. These are the cell bodies. And you can see, remember I said 1 to 10,000 connections per neuron. You can see how dense this wiring is. Where do you actually put a probe to actually measure what's going on? There's no room. Well, we'll talk about that. So Ramoni Cajal said that when he started looking at one in a thousand of the complexity of the brain, that even at that level, it was an impenetrable jungle. And later Francis Crick said, an impenetrable jungle where many people have lost their way. This is, of course, the Nobel Prize um, for discovering uh, DNA, the structure of DNA. And he thought this was an incredibly complex problem, and he busied himself with it for the rest of his life. He didn't really make as much progress as he did on DNA for obvious reasons. So let's define the quest that we're going to set out on, that we have set out on, but I'm going to introduce you to it today and tomorrow morning. So the natural evolution of inquiry to actually explore the brain is first to look at the structure of the brain. And back in 1883, this field of phrenology, which was sort of half hocus-pocus and half real science, well, by the way, we should talk about some ground rules. My name is Michael. Shout out my name if you want to ask a question. It's fine to interrupt me. I'm not here to make myself feel good and important. I'm here to talk to you guys and let you guys know something about the brain. So it's about you, it's not about me. Shout out your questions, please, okay? So this phrenology uh, really was sort of a pseudoscience, but it evolved into learning about the structure and the fu function of different parts of the brain. Now this is actually sort of uh, interesting and storied history, finding out how parts of the brain actually contribute to consciousness. And much of it actually is a sad story because we learn things from others' misfortune. In particular, there was this poor guy whose name was Phineas Gage. He was working on railroads in 1848, tamping down explosive charges with a rod that he held in his hand, and one of them exploded and drove that rod through his brain, and he lived to tell the story. That's the good part. In part, because of these lesions, don't worry, I'm not going to be too gory in this talk, just a little gory, okay? In part, because of dysfunction, we can actually, we have actually learned about how different parts of the brain actually contribute to consciousness and brain function through loss of speech, loss of sight, and other things. It can be studied and correlated with different sort of dysfunctions in the brain. So in the late 1800s, various people began to essentially as, uh, assemble all of these different facts uh, and began to go from this original sort of phrenology, this sort of pseudoscience of phrenology, uh, into a more disciplined science of actually understanding how brain function is actually localized to certain regions of the brain. Today we have much better tools, of course, that we can explore, use to explore the structure and function of the brain. And there's this word connectome, which obviously uh, is stems from connect, and it's basically <coughs> describing how different parts of the brains are brain is wired up. Okay, so the second part of the evolution in going from sort of the overall structure of the brain is how are different parts of the brain connected? What is the connectome? So I'll talk about that. Here's an interesting fact. A typical 20-year-old male has about 176,000 kilometers of myelinated fiber in the brain's white matter. So the gray matter is the out outer region of the brain where computation happens, and most of what's in um, the white matter of the brain are these connections. And this is about half the distance to the moon. Okay? Other interesting fact, 20-year-old females have only 149,000 kilometers. Now, this probably was discovered by male scientists, so I'm not sure we can believe it, uh, but I guess I would say that probably women are more efficient than men are. <laughs> 
The third part of the quest is actually not just understanding the wiring, but understanding all the bits, the bits of information that are flying on this wiring and how computation is done. And this is what we've actually set out to do, we meaning a whole community of people around the world, is not to just look at connectome or connectomics, but look at functional connectomics. Basically, create an atlas of brain activity under, under different conditions, stimuli, etc., to create an activity map, a brain activity map. And so that's what I'm going to be talking to you. That's basically the core of, of what I want to discuss. It's a very exciting quest. And part of the story that's interesting that I wanted to tell you about, a little bit of sociology about how science is done, is um, in 2010, I was in Oslo. Uh, for the Kavli Prizes, which were awarded every couple of years. And we had this nice dinner. These are dinner tables down here in this wonderful auditorium. And afterwards, we went upstairs and we're drinking some cognac. And I was with two other directors of institutes uh, in the Kavli constellation. Ralph Greenspan, who's the co-director of the Kavli in Institute of Neuroscience at UC San Diego, and Edvard Moser, who's the co-director of the Kavli Institute for Neuroscience in Trondheim, Norway. And uh, we were saying that nano and neuro should be complementary. We should figure out a way to begin working together. And so we just went to the other side of the room and found uh, Myung Chung, who is a a molecular biologist and also happens to be the vice president of the Kavli Foundation, and she's a force of nature in her own right, and told her we should have a workshop. And so she put one together the following year. This happened in London. And so here's the small group of people that got together from all around the world to just brainstorm together about how neuro and nano could actually create new opportunities. And so we had some really exciting talks and stuff. And then everybody filed out of the room. And the six of us were left standing at the front of the room saying, what should we do next? And Rafa Yusta, a neuroscientist who's a co-director of the Kavli Institute at Columbia University, said we should write a white paper, a position paper. And I said, that's a really dumb idea. But we wrote one anyway. And it became a paper, and we started working with the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy. They were looking for grand challenges in science. And lo and behold, they liked the idea. And a couple of years later, President Obama launched the United States' Brain Initiative. And then things got very dark. Because people said, who are these people? I haven't heard of them, all the important people in neuroscience. They're going to use up all our money for doing regular neuroscience to do this crazy stuff. But nonetheless, nonetheless um, things went forward, and this brain initiative is happening in fits and starts, but we're beginning to do interesting stuff. From the standpoint of a physical scientist, I think of the brain as being fields, okay, in the sense of physical fields. Electric fields, chemical concentrations, mechanical forces, and these vary in space and time. And so it's a measurement problem. If I could get in there somehow with fine enough detail, with good enough temporal resolution, I should be able to figure out all the activity in the brain. Of course, this is sort of crazy thoughts, right? But we've got to proceed with crazy thoughts. That's when it's fun. So let me tell you the backdrop, then, of this challenge and where neuroscience has come from over the last, let's say, 50 to 100 years. Today, neuroscience is very good at the macro scale. We can understand the architecture of the brain and the wiring of the brain, and it's very good at the micro scale, we know a lot about individual neurons. It's the mesoscale which is the challenge, knowing how a lot of individual neurons collectively have function that gives rise to higher function in the brain and ultimately consciousness. This is where the challenge is, and this is what I want to talk to you about. Before I do that, though, <clears throat> 
let's actually review the macro and the micro scale and the measurements that are done and what's learned. So to describe the macro scale, I'm going to talk about a project in the U.S. There are other projects around the world, but the project in the U.S. Uh, funded by the National Institute of Health called the Human Connectome Project. And what this is, it uses magnetic resonance imaging. Okay? You've, you, you all know about magnetic resonance imaging, used for getting interesting pictures of the body in three-dimensional detail. Well, it turns out that you can actually use this in a special way to understand activity, not just structure, but activity associated with metabolism. And this is called diffusion tens tensor imaging, functional magnetic resonance imaging. Functional to make a distinction between sort of morph morphology, function means some sort of activity. Okay? And so by studying how under certain cognitive tasks the brain lights up with activity, how essentially blood oxygenation levels change, and then doing correlations between task and different regions of the brain, this really cool connectome wiring in the white matter of the brain can be elucidated. So isn't it done? I mean, everything that I'm talking about? No, the answer is that it's not done. I want to make an analogy to what this um, connectomics of this form actually can achieve. So I'm going to liken what the uh, fMRI DTI achieves to essentially looking at a network of computers in the brain. So I'm basically saying that what it actually allows you to look at is regional processors in the brain. So I'm going to make an analogy to computer networks. And the reason why I say regional processors is the smallest resolution that magnetic resonance imaging has, the form of magnetic resonance imaging that's in hospitals and is used for these explorations, the finest resolution it has is something about a millimeter or so on a side. And a millimeter of brain tissue has about 100,000 neurons. So obviously that individual voxel, that's a three-dimensional pixel, an individual voxel already has many, many neurons that are doing some function, okay? So that's why I say each voxel is like a little regional processor. How this actually works is there's some sort of cognitive task that's given to the subject, a person, and you image the local computational activity by this blood oxygenation level. And then you note that under certain tasks, there's correlations of activity that emerge. And through looking at these correlations, essentially you can elucidate something like the network, the computer network, okay? That's how this connectomics project actually works. But we want to go further. We're not satisfied with averaging over 100,000 neurons. There are individual bits of these regional processors. I'm going to liken it to a computer circuit. The bits are spiking of the individual neurons. Remember, per voxel, there's 100,000. And each of those neurons I'm likening to a logic gate. And so our task, the thing that we're interested in, is to look at the logic transitions as a function of time at each individual neuron to look at the bits that are flying through the brain and try to make sense of it, try to understand how the brain computes. We haven't had the tools to do this, and that's what I think nanoscience can actually provide. Let's look at the other level, down at the individual neuron level. There's a rich history here that's fun to talk about. Yes, please. I didn't hear the last part. Speak up, please. Sorry, um, How can it improve what? Yeah. 
So Tom Insel, who's the director of the National Institute of Mental Health in the U.S., um, gives a really interesting talk, which you can find at the TEDx Caltech website. And he says that many brain dysfunctions are circuit dysfunctions. So we need to understand brain circuits to actually understand these diseases. Now, it's some distance away actually understanding these circuits, as you'll see in this lecture and the next one, but that's really the hope. Now, you're asking something about nanotechnology as well? I didn't understand. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. Well, I would say that I'm more interested in future technologies helping the brain rather than vice versa. Of course, there's always feedback between the two. Okay? Please shout out your questions because I enjoy questions and it helps steer me to things that are interesting to you. So I'm going to talk about how individual neurons compute. And about 40 years ago, a couple of guys discovered how to actually tap into the electrical activity of individual neurons using a pipette. A friend of mine who's a famous scientist and the director uh, of a huge engineering department at a famous university said, oh yeah, those guys got the Nobel Prize for the pipette. Okay, that's not quite true. That sounds very pedestrian, a uh, Nobel Prize for the pipette. No, they got the Nobel Prize for the thing I'll tell you about in a moment, using a pipette, okay? So it's possible to go up to an individual neuron, and this is pictures again, this is a cartoon of course, but it looks really cool. Um, I stole it from somebody else, the credit's down here. Um, individual neurons and then some only some of the thousands of processes that emerge and connect to other neurons. This is this pipette that actually goes down and you suck in the cell membrane and you don't break it to begin with, okay? And the cell membrane is studded with ion channels that open and close and control the electrical activity of the brain uh, or of the neuron. And this pipette is filled with an ionic solution that conducts electricity and there's an electrode that goes here uh, and then you'll have an electrode outside. And so what this allows you to do is to actually monitor the electrical current, the ions that are flowing in and out of these ion channels. And this became a very rich field called single channel recording. And this shows the current measured in the scale of picoamps over the time scale of milliseconds. And these transitions between two levels show current of a single ion channel in a cell membrane opening and closing on this time scale. There's many of these ion channels per membrane. So that, that's pretty cool and the, to my mind, definitely worth a Nobel Prize. Okay, and so here's the guys that are responsible for it. Now I'm not gonna talk about this. I'm gonna talk about what happens if you put too much suction on the pipette and actually break the cell membrane. Now you actually have a direct electrical connection inside the neuron. And if you put a reference electrode outside, it allows you to look at the electrical activity across the cell membrane, okay? And this shows the spiking, and this is what I'm gonna make the analogy to the logic states of an individual neuron. This allows you to measure directly and with high fidelity all of the interesting electrical activity of a neuron, okay? And if you want, you can put some fluorescent molecules, since you have direct uh, fluidic contact to the interior of the cell, in each one of these little pipettes, you can put some fluorescent molecules and cause all the neurons to light up in sort of an active way, a fluorescent way, similar to what uh, Golgi did with his stain, but now we can actually image, make much more pretty pictures, right? And here's a picture, okay? That's just a pretty picture. Yes, please. Any, anything from, <laughs> yeah, so, so anything. So I have friends that work on uh, Drosophila, little fruit flies. You know, they have very, very tiny pipettes. Uh, I have friends that work on um, cockroaches, uh, that work on locusts, mice, rats, non-human primates, that means monkeys, to humans, okay? <laughs> 
Yes. They do, but it turns out that, the, as you might imagine, um, and I, I strongly, if you find this interesting, go and look at some of the great talks that were given at TEDx Caltech, The Brain. Um, it Michael Dickinson gave a talk about fruit flies, Drosophila, and he points out that the neurons are like a tenth the size of the neurons you know, in mammals. And they have different structure, and they operate slightly differently, and again, you need really fine pipettes. But all of these things are interesting. Uh, I'm going to get carried away and go off on a tangent here, so let me get back to, uh, to the main theme. But I was going to say something about uh, mouse models and fruit fly models for anger and stuff like that. Uh, but, uh, you know, because we'd like to learn as much as we can from lower species instead of tapping into people's brains, right? Uh, you can only do that under very strict conditions. But I digress. So let me tell you a little bit. I'm going to give you now a few slides, uh, introduction to some core th uh, facts about neuroscience and how neurons work and how they compute. And this will be sort of a foundation for a bunch of the stuff that I want to continue talking about later. Yes, was there a question? Can you just speak up a little bit? Yeah. Oh, it doesn't. No, this is this is destructive. Yeah, once you actually patch, that's what it's called. You you pull and you break the cell membrane. You got a few hours to do an experiment before lights are out. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Uh, with a sharp knife. <laughs> After you remove part of the skull. I'm a physicist. I know how this is done, but I'm not in the lab when it's done. I was pre-med, and I decided after doing my first uh, dissections and stuff, I really liked equations better. <laughs> Sorry, can you raise your hand? I'm having trouble localizing. Yes, go ahead. Um, when you're in those experiments on primates, how are you thinking of Oh, um, okay, so we should, we should do an aside and talk about this. So it's heavily regulated experimental human neuroscience, and it proceeds slowly. And the reason why it proceeds slowly is, of course, you have to have patient's consent, and usually the only time you can actually tap into somebody's brain is when something has gone horribly wrong, right? So it's under the conditions of, you know, severe epilepsy or brain, you know, uh, traumatic brain injuries or brain cancer when the subjects graciously permit the scientists to actually explore the regions immediate to where the damage happens and science moves forward. Okay, but there's no science, crazy science fiction stuff, to my knowledge, going on, certainly not in the U.S., where people are just tapping randomly into people's brains and putting all sorts of wires and stuff. It doesn't happen. Yes. Ah. Yes. That's a, that's a great question, and I am not... Uh, fully equipped to give a very uh, thoughtful uh, position on this, but primates are our closest link, you know, to other species, and it's a really critical um, element for advancing human neuroscience. It has to be done judiciously. I'm sure they feel pain, but I'm not a primate, so I don't know for sure. Um, I mean, I'm not a non-human primate. I guess I'm a human primate. <laughs> I hope I'm a primate. Um, yeah, so, but it's, there is a lot of debate um, currently in the U.S. about whether the National Institute of Health should phase out primate research. But the people that are actually involved in it know that if that link is broken, then it's already very difficult 
uh, for people to do research, you know, given the cases I talked about where, um, you know, the only time you can actually get into human brains and actually study what's going on is when there's something gone horribly wrong and the patients give you permission. If, if we don't have access to primates, the advancement of neuroscience will go even slower than it has, okay? So, you know, I, I, I can't really thoughtfully engage in the debate or represent all the sides of the debate, but I do know this as a scientist, that it's really essential if we want to make advances in neuroscience. Animal models are good models of animals, but they're not good models of, or insects. People talk about, uh, this is what I was going to say earlier, there's an interesting talk by Michael Dickinson who comes out immediately and says, after a speaker says, I have a, a model for anger based on fruit flies. He said, I think the only thing that models, a, and he studies Drosophila, the only thing that Drosophila are good for is models of Drosophila, right? So we need ultimately, you know, the, the ground truth is going to be human neuroscience. And so we're going to have to figure out ways of understanding that. Okay. So that's an important aside to actually have made, but yeah, but I'm, I'm, I'm a scientist, not a philosopher and a humanist really, so yes. Well, I don't know. Um, I don't think all the nuances, you know, all the fine differences between non-human primates and primates are understood. And that's not my area of ex expertise, so I can't really give you definitive answers about that. Let's leave it at that. Okay, so let me get back just to the basics of, uh, of how neurons com compute. Uh, and so what I have a picture here is two neurons that are connected by an axon and dendrites, okay? A transmitting neuron where the information is that it come from and a receiving neuron. And they're connected through axons and dendrites, okay? The sense of information flow, the neural impulses, flow along the axons and are picked up at synapses, the connections between uh, the axons and the dendrites. They're transmitted across and then the receiving neuron picks up those signals. Signal propagation velocities along axons, especially these kinds here, which are myelinated axons, they're like coaxial cables, uh, and the myelinated uh, axons are the, f are the fastest transmission lines that you have in your body. Signal propagation velocities can be something like 60 to 120 meters per second. And so what that means is in going from the two meters from your little toe up to your brain, it takes about a 30th of a second, okay? So that's, that's pretty fast. Now let's focus on how the connection is made and how the information is transmitted because it's really quite fascinating. It's transmitted across synaptic junctions. And the re region right between the axon and the dendrites is called the synaptic cleft, okay? So you have an electrical wave, basically, that's traveling along uh, the axon and is converted, basically, at the synapse, or at least at chemical synapses, uh, into a chemical signal that's transmitted across. The junction between the axon and the dendrite is only about 20 nanometers, okay? And the way the transmission actually occurs is neurotransmitter, which is store, stored in these little balloons, if you will, little micro nano balloons called vesicles, under the impulse of the wave of electrical impulse that actually travels to the synapse, these are released into the synaptic cleft. They're preferentially bound or, or collected uh, by receptors, molecules that are on the surface of the dendrite, uh, at the dendrite synapse, and these induce a signal that then propagates down now the dendrite into the receiving neuron. And obviously, this has to be maintained uh, in readiness, and so there's local enzymes that, once these things are released, gobble them up after a little while to reset basically that synapse so that another um, signal can be received in short order.
Now, individual neurons themselves actually compute. Let me describe how that actually works. So again, reminding you about this architecture that I described, there are, from an adjacent neuron, axons come down and will have one of their processes that can either attach uh, to a dendrite, which is sort of the sensor of the adjacent neuron, or they can attach to the cell wall, um, or dendrites can attach to dendrites. But typically we think of the uh, synaptic junction as being primarily between axons and dendrites. Okay? And there are different types of connections that are made. Um, they're excitatory and they're inhibitory connections that are made. Okay? And let me describe how that actually works. In its resting state, there's something like about 70 millivolts, minus 70 millivolts of potential across the membrane of a neuron. Okay? And we call that the neuron's resting potential. From an adjacent neuron, a signal comes in and actually creates a local perturbation of that membrane potential. If that perturbation doesn't exceed something like about 15 millivolts, then all remains steady. But if two of these stimuli, these so-called excitatory presynaptic potentials, come in close enough in time where they overlap because there's some sort of time scale over which these excitations decay. If they come in close enough in time, they overlap and they can push the resting potential above minus 55 millivolts, and that induces uh, exceeds the threshold for excitation, and so the cell spikes, and it basically neutralizes momentarily uh, itself. There's a big electrical signal, and that sends now a signal through all the processes that then propagate to other neurons uh, that are connected through its axons, its processes. Okay, so here they didn't overlap in time, here they did. You can also have signals coming from two neurons, and if they overlap in time, two axons from two different neurons, if they overlap in time close enough, these two different signals can act basically to exceed the threshold, and this is basically like an AND gate. Two high signals come in and kick the neuron into activity. Finally, there are also inhibitory neurons, so if an excitatory presynaptic potential, let me um, put this up here, so EPSP and IPSP are excitatory and inhibitory. If an excitatory impulse comes in, but at the same time an inhibitory impulse comes in, these can neutralize each other and it can prevent the neuron from firing. Okay, so individual neurons compute. Yes? all of the above. And I'm going to show you some recordings taken, electrical recordings taken from awake, freely moving rat. And what you'll find is that the more electrodes you put in, the more you hear of all the activity in the brain. And when you actually think about 100 billion neurons with something like 1,000 trillion synapses, all firing simultaneously that give rise to our consciousness, it's just like totally awesome, even just to tap into a little bit of that. And in all of you here, there's this amazing stuff. <sighs> when you hear it actually electrically, this is what's going on in our brains. And somehow this gives rise to consciousness. It's just mind boggling. Yes? Yeah. Absolutely. Right. How do I define it? Oh, I prefer not to. <laughs> Sorry, that's a facile answer, but uh, yeah, I'm not going to try to struggle with it up here. Uh, I'm just a guy who does measurements, okay? 
How's that for a non-answer? Yes? Yeah, we can actually stimulate the brain. And so far, the way we do this, I'll talk about this tomorrow, but so far the way we do this is more akin to an epileptic seizure than actually creating very fine-tuned information into the brain. You know, we just blast the brain, right? Because we don't, haven't had the tools to actually create very fine excitation patterns. But in future, even at, you know, soon, we believe that we'll be able to do this highly pa locally patterned, fine stimulation to actually talk to the brain in its natural language. That would be an incredible dream to realize. Lots of questions here. Okay. Oh, let's go down here. Um, several slides ago, you mentioned, or you had an image of uh, the connector when you were talking about how uh, specific areas of the brain that are connected to the Okay, so I'm, I'm also going to give a facile answer to this one. Lots of work has been done for the last 50 years on one or a couple neurons. There's essentially no work done on thousands or hundreds of thousands or millions of neurons and how they collectively compute. That's what we want to do. And I'm going to talk about how we're actually building the technology to do that. But it's an open frontier. And one of the things, even for what we're doing today, uh, which is uh, today I'll show you, or tomorrow I will show you that today we have uh, the ability to record from a thousand neurons continuously at their, uh, you know, their chosen temporal uh, evolution. And um, for these thousand neurons, you know, we're getting gigabytes per second of data, right? So when you actually think about, I want to go, I'm going to talk my talk is going to culminate in, in uh, describing technology based on photonics that will allow us, you know, we have a grant where we promise to record from a million neurons in three years. Never been done, okay? With a million neurons, we're going to have such an amazing, uh, frightening data stream that we need new big data paradigms to sift through, to data mine, to understand. We don't know how to do that yet. But my view you know, and this is sort of, I'm giving you the punchline of my second talk, my view is that, like building a telescope, you wouldn't tell astronomers not to get the data, not to look at the stars, right? So we want to get the data and then be faced with the challenge once we have the data of figuring it out. And so this is new science. We don't know, we don't know where it's going to lead and we don't know if we have the computational tools to do it, but we're going to start, okay? I'm not sure I answered your question, but I tried. Um, I see lots of questions, and I'm happy to answer everything, but realize that I won't cover everything that I plan to, but that's fine, because this is for you, not for me. So. Stimulate what? Emotions, yes. Yeah. Yes. So, there is, so what's really cool about this is um, there are a couple of public um, TV shows that you could probably find on the web. Uh, one was done by Sanjay Gupta, who is the health correspondent for CNN. And he's actually a neuroscientist or a neurosurgeon at Emory University on leave, I guess. Maybe they canceled his professorship because he's gone so long. I don't know. Anyway, but um, anyway, he interviewed a bunch of people at Emory who are at the forefront of deep brain stimulation. This is with only like three electrodes. And what they found is, of course, they do this. This is for, done only for very severe conditions like Parkinson's disease. And it's now actually been approved in experimental use for 
profound um, depression, and what they you know people that just can't move you know because they're so they're so profoundly depressed, and uh, what they what they found they he actually shows um, uh, a film of a remarkable woman who you know they don't know exactly where to put these electrodes and they don't know exactly why it works and it's extremely crude it's like you know a sledgehammer in exciting all sorts of neurons and stuff nonetheless it does work and what they found is that as they insert the electrodes and it's stimulating a whole range of different emotions can be elicited right so what was your question again but it was related to emotions <laughs> yeah so will we be able and the answer is you know, I'm sort of a determinist. I mean, I believe at the end of the day that there's nothing, uh, and, and I, forgive me if I offend anybody, but nothing particularly uh, spiritual or magic about how the brain works. I'm a reductionist, and I think it's all firing neurons, right? And so if we can actually figure out what the patterns are, we can do everything. So it's a question of having the technology, having the finesse, and having big data computation to actually figure out what the hell's going on in the brain. Yes? I don't know. I didn't invent the brain. Yeah. But, you know, there, this, is, this sort of gets at uh, an age-old question uh, that physical scientists and biologists argue about. Physicists like this idea of elegance, simplicity, and that should be the rule of the day. Least action potentials, stuff like that. Uh, at least action principles and stuff like that. You know, if it's elegant and it's simple, it's probably right. Biologists like complexity. And they say that, sure, you know, in certain things, probably nature finds elegant solutions. But sometimes it, it gets stuck in really complex solutions that aren't particularly well engineered, but they're good enough. Right? What was your question again? Remember, I'm jet lagged, so I forget what questions are once I get going. Just why? Yeah, so why? Yeah, so I don't know why. You know? And I'm not sure anybody knows why, but it is, right? It just is. So sort of the, you know, the, sort of the evolution or the course of investigation that I think people are taking is a very rational one. Let's just accept it that this is how nature has organized itself and now try to understand how it works and why it works. Up at the top there, please. Yeah, so you can patch pretty much any, any kind of neural uh, cell. And there was one more question, and then I'll, I'll get back to things. Yes, you. Oh, there's two. Wait, raise your hand, because I, I'm having a problem. You, okay, good. Yes, go ahead, yes. I wish I knew. Yikes. I mean, I, I don't have a clue. I wish I knew. Uh, again, I'm just a measurement guy, okay? You know, what's, this, is, this is the chasm between this amazing computational machine, the substrate from which emerges consciousness, right? And then our very feeble, baby-like steps and to try to tap into it and understand what's going on. Maybe someday we will understand this, but I would say we're really a long way off. And you had a question. I didn't hear the last part. Do they all interconnect? So they're different, yeah, I would say, you know, we're far from understanding, you know, in a complete way how the brain is organized and how things are partitioned. Um, I'm going to talk tomorrow about the following. When we proposed the brain initiative, 
and all the cognoscenti in neuroscience said, who are these people? We don't know these people, you know. Um, some intemperate comments were made, uh, not by me, but by one of my colleagues, one of us six, saying we're going to record from all the, you know, the, the neurons in the brain. And everybody said, oh, you can't do that, not in our lifetime. And we said, okay, yeah, that's right. We're not going to be able to do that in our lifetime, but we're going to be able to record from a lot of them. And so then the question was, how can we actually make sense? How can we actually find regional processors in the brain? What is a regional processor in the brain? And it turns out, as I'll describe tomorrow, there are certain structures in the brain, smaller structures that involve maybe 100,000 or a million or several million neurons, where there are many more connections internal to these regions than there are outside. And that looks like a good candidate for some sort of localization. Having said that, it is already understood that many, if perhaps most, computations in their brain are hugely distributed over all parts of the brain. And I'll talk again, I'll talk, I'll talk about this in a moment actually, but more tomorrow. So the answer is, Yes and no, you know, some of both. Uh, we don't know. We need to make more measurements. We need better tools. That's what I'm going to talk about. Okay, let me go forward a little bit. And, but I'm just, just going to say, you asked me to remind you when you go to about 55 minutes. And we're already there? And <laughs> Holy moly. <laughs> I know. Okay. Have to do this on the fly, okay. You can go for a while. Yeah, you just, you just tell me when you would like me to wrap up. When, you, when I start seeing people nodding off or whatever, I mean... It's yeah. more about leaving a bit of time for questions and then also dinner, so... Okay, yeah. We'll see we go. Okay, good. Okay, so I'll go forward. Now I'm going to talk really fast. No. Um, so I'll remind you of what the thread was. We were talking about 100 billion neurons in the brain, how many can we record from? What is the technology that's gone before? And then tomorrow I'm going to talk to you about the technology that we're trying to jumpstart. And so when you actually patch neurons, if you're an expert, you have to do this on the fly because ultimately the cells die. You have to put the pipettes on individual neurons. The maximum that's done after 40 years of development is 10 or 12 neurons, okay? And so this is my colleague, my close colleague, Andreas Tolius, uh, Shaoling Zhang is an um, expert in his group of doing these multi-patchings, and he can do it with eight patch clamps that are sort of motor-driven things, you know, that can get in there on the fly and actually patch. And there are six layers in the cortex, and he can patch to different layers in the cortex and actually measure the connection strengths between different neurons, okay, and investigate, even though this is a very, very small sampling of this incredibly rich and dense structure, that's how far he can go. That's patching. Now, it turns out that you can actually put more electrodes in the brain if you don't try to actually patch directly to the cell membrane, okay? And this has a longer history, 230 years of people actually putting electrodes into uh, neural tissue, starting with Galvani. And so let me compare what I'm talking about, extracellular recording to this patching or intracellular recording. So here's a patch clamp, basically, or a, a patch electrode doing whole cell recording. And here is a twisted tetrode of four wires insulated all the way down, except for at the bottom, they're exposed. And you can record the firing of an individual neuron or, or multiple neurons through both techniques. Why is it possible to record from extracellular electrodes? Because when the cell depolarizes, when it fires, ions flow in from the outside, the extracellular region. If there is an ionic current, there are local voltages, and you just put a wire down there, and you can sense them. Here's the intracellular beautiful signals that you get at sort of the 60 millivolt scale. Here's what you see in the extracellular. It looks like a mess, but if you filter the low frequency wiggles, you can see there's a replica of the spiking. More easily done to put in just wires in the extracellular space. But there's a price you pay, and the price is that you lose three orders of magnitude or more in sensitivity. We go from millivolts, 60 millivolts or so, down to the tens of microvolt scale, okay? And it's much more noisy, and so on. Nonetheless, 
This is the fodder for Nobel Prizes and things, even just recording from a few cells. Last year, the Nobel Prize was given for what's called the neural positioning system. Basically, it turns out that if you put a rodent in a maze, as it runs around in certain places, actually, individual neurons can fire. They're called place cells, and I'll show you an example of that. In fact, it's, it turns out that there are not only place cells, there's speed cells, there's head orientation cells, and so on. John O'Keefe was one of the people, uh, was the person who first discovered place cells in 1971. He also invented the tetrode. Um, and this shows a cartoon of a rat moving around, and in certain locations in space, an individual place cell, an individual neuron in the, the millions of neurons in the rat's brain, fires when that rat is in a certain part of the maze. Two postdocs that were in his group at the time went off and started their own laboratories uh, in Norway, my Brit and Edvard Moser, they happened to be married, uh, and they found that in a different region of the brain, these place cells actually project and neural computation happens, and there are place in the entorhinal cortex, a different part of the brain, there are cells called grid cells. And now on a hexagonal lattice, a grid cell will fire here and here and here and here as the rat or the mouse is moving around um, in that maze. This is recording from my really uh, close collaborator, Thanos Siapas at Caltech. He's a professor of neuroscience, and our groups are fused, basically, to develop this technology. This shows a rat with three LEDs, so you can actually figure out what its head orientation is. There's a maze here, which is basically a cross. He's going to run across this rat back and forth, and when he's in the center here, you're going to actually hear a place cell firing. Yes. So it turns out if you move more than about 50 microns away from a neuron, you can't record any more from that neuron. And I'll talk about this in a moment, or maybe tomorrow. I guess tomorrow. Um, and so it's luck. You put it in there, maybe you find a place cell, maybe you don't. If you put a lot of electrodes in, one of them maybe has a place cell, and you have to put them in the right part. A couple of millimeters down in the brain is the hippocampus. Remember that uh, layer of cells that I showed you earlier? That's called CA1. I don't know what CA stands for. CA1, that's where the place cells are. So you put electrodes in there and look for them. Okay, so imagine if we could measure more than one neuron you know, we could actually start to see computation. I mean, these are interesting, really cool things that individual neurons do, but of course, 100 billion neurons gives rise to consciousness, and so that would be really cool to understand. So how do we record from many neurons uh, extracellularly? We make lots of electrodes. It turns out kind of a scary thing is here is a couple millimeter on a side grid of about 100 electrodes. These are insulated all the way down to their tips where they're exposed. This is implanted with a hydraulic gun into the cortex of a patient. I don't think it's painful because you don't have, you know, uh, touch sensors in your brain. Uh, but of course, this is somebody who is um, uh, tetraplegic and in fact, this can give actually a cortical interface to connect to electronics to actually do interesting things like move cursors around on the screen or actually move prosthetic uh, limbs. And this are using, so this is basically kind of uh, electro-machined uh, using silicon chip technology. 
uh, starting back in the 1960s, it's been possible to make many, many more electrodes, and now we're using nanotechnology, as I'll show you, to do this. Uh, and this shows a commercial multi-site electrode, which is used to do recordings. This is, again, my uh, close uh, colleague, Andreas Tolius's group, um, working in monkeys. Um, this is the brain interface that's actually used to study neuroscience in monkeys. So how far has this technology progressed? We've gone from the 1960s, these first patch electrodes, to tetrodes in, in, uh, invented by John O'Keefe in the 1970s, and the first work with silicon microfabrication technology to build probes, all the way up to the present, some of the work that was done in my group uh, in the past decade. But even all these wonderful advances have only got us up to about a couple hundred neurons. Okay, so we need orders of magnitude improvement in the complexity. So it turns out that it's possible not to do imaging, but to do functional imaging, to use light to actually study how neurons fire. And here it looks perhaps more promising because now up to 30,000 neurons have been studied simultaneously. But there's a really critical caveat that this is only applicable to transparent specimens. And to give you an illustration of how this works, this is a scanning beam of light that finds images, basically, through scanning where the neural bodies are. And then once you actually locate them, instead of scanning places where the neuron bodies aren't, the neural bodies aren't, you actually can just dwell on where they are and actually look at, through optical interrogation, the firing of neurons. and it's complicated to build this, okay, <laughs> given the time. Even this, though, uh, this complicated scanning gives, in the cortex, about 500 neurons, but through a technique called light sheet microscopy, it's possible to get up tens of thousands of neurons, but only in a really microscopic org organism, a, a larvae of a fish called a zebrafish. That's only about 300 microns in cross-section. It's a remarkable achievement, but it's not directly translatable to higher mammals, let's say, primates, or even rodents. But this shows in a zebrafish that's only 300 microns thick, uh, individual firing of neurons in that zebrafish. Okay. Where are we at time-wise? Well, we're, we're coming up to, there's about 15 minutes left in the session. Okay. To okay. It's a good time to, to say, Wrap up we and either keep going, yeah. and don't have question time today, or we stop and answer questions today. Yeah. And so I, I guess, you know, the yeah. floor is yours. Which would you like to do? Well, what would you guys like to do? You guys have a lot of questions you want to ask, or you want me to go on for five minutes or so? What? <laughs> okay. I don't have a lot more that I was going to talk about. Uh, I'm just going to wrap up a little bit, and then I'm going to pick up the technology later, okay? But let's keep the agreement that if you have a pressing question, you just shout it out, and I'll stop like I did before and answer your questions, okay? Again, you know, I don't need to talk about all this stuff. It's only if it's interesting to you. So what's the state of the art in imaging? It turns out that you can fire uh, an optical beam in the infrared, it's called two-photon excitation, and you can localize. That raster scan beam is in the infrared, and it can penetrate a millimeter deep in brain tissue. Uh, visible light will not penetrate. It's maybe an order of magnitude less deep, so you only get very superficial. And then if you label the neurons appropriately, uh, you get visible light coming out that you detect. You don't look at it. You actually use photodetectors and stuff. And this is used for structural imaging and functional imaging. But there's a fundamental limit here to the optics, and the reason why this optical technique so far has only been applicable to really thin, transparent tissues is that light ultimately gets stopped by brain tissue after about a millimeter or so. And we can describe how brain tissue stops light in the following plot. 
This shows the decay length of light in uh, microns uh, as a function of the wavelength that I show visible to near infrared. The longer the decay length is, the further the light penetrates into the brain. And you can see what the problem is here. Okay, that uh, there's absorption of light, there's scattering of light. If the light scatters, like this is essentially looking through a milky solution, you can see that there's some sort of illumination, but you can't make an image out, you know, through a milky solution. That's scattering. And the combination of the two is what limits the imaging. And so this is all below basically a millimeter. A thousand microns is a millimeter, right? So that's the reason why pretty much at any wavelength we can't get very deep in the brain. The cortex of a mouse is three millimeters. Cortex of a human is maybe five or more, right? So if we want to get deep into the brain and look at all this correlated activity, it doesn't look like light's going to get us there, even though it looks like maybe you can image functionally and get more neurons. So optics, or at least free space optics, allows us superficial interrogation of the activity of the brain. Only the most superficial parts of the outer part of the brain, called the cortex, but the inside of the brain is inaccessible. So, what I'm going to talk about tomorrow is how nano can break these impasses. And then that's it. I finished my talk. <laughs> <laughs> I like the fact that he's, he's so excited by that. <laughs> <laughs> we got there. Hooray. Um, we do